Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live, brought to you by Crowcast. Joining me tonight is Peter J. How are you going, Nick? Pete? <laughs> I'm good, mate. How are you this evening? Yeah, not too bad. And Nikki, how are you going, Nick? I'm going well. And you? Yeah, not too bad for Tuesday night. I reckon <clears throat> uh, we're all looking forward to Easter and a little bit of a break. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think I think certainly uh, a, a bit of a break from um, some of the um, some of the bad football that we've seen over the last <laughs> uh, couple of weeks. Jeez, it's been uh, some ordinary stuff, isn't it? And uh, just while I'm on it, a quick hello to everyone joining us in the chat room tonight. It's always great to have uh, everyone along in the chat and seeing all the regulars there. Absolutely. All right, without any further ado, why don't we get straight back into the Crows news, shall we? One of the great benefits of doing the Tuesday show is that when you have a stinker like we did on the weekend, I, the anger seems to dissipate by Tuesdays <laughs> and I seem to be a little bit more circumspect. But then I, uh, I, copped, I saw a little bit of news coming through on the, on the wires today and uh, it, was the, uh, it was an interview that was done with, uh, with Bryce Gibbs in relation to his um, omission for last week's game. I don't know if you caught that, um, but uh, it was quite an instructive little piece and uh, I'm sure it wasn't uh, vetted by, um, uh, by the, the regular media people at the club because uh, he straight out said that he was uh, quite shocked uh, at his uh, dismissal, uh, or shouldn't I shouldn't say dismissal? Omission. I meant to say sorry. Yeah, he was quite shocked, and also that um, he accepted that he'd played a bad game in round one, and that he'd been told he played it that he needed to uh, you know do a few things to uh, pick up his form. He was happy that in rounds two and three that his form was building, um, and that he had received positive feedback from the coaches for his round two and round three performances. And so that last Thursday when he got a telephone call from the coach saying, you're out, it was uh, quite a shock. Um, uh, uh, did you read that? No, where was it, Pete? It was just a, it was a bite out of uh, Fox Sports News. And it was a, uh, did you read it? Did you see it, Nick? No, I saw the headlines, but I haven't had a chance to have a look yeah. at it. So it's direct quotes from from Bryce it's not you know it's a it's, a, it's, an, it's a, an, an interview attributed to him but I saw that today and I just um I thought jeez you know you've got a senior player like that who um you know has been counseled that uh, his his form was building and improving and gets positive feedback and then just out of nowhere is the uh, is the omission on Thursday by telephone I thought the whole thing stank to high heaven, to be honest, but um, I don't know what you think about that. Well, funnily enough, um, I'd heard that it was a mutual decision, so that obviously throws that out of the water. Um, I guess it wouldn't be unusual for a player to find out about selection by telephone. Like if they're not at the yeah, club, partic- then Yeah, particularly how- if they yeah, Thursdays, or it's often on Wednesdays or Thursdays, so it depends on when they were training because of when they were playing. So um, the fact that they contacted him, I mean, I, 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 I kind of don't have a problem with it being a phone call because oh, we, we I, don't know what kind of days, days it are. But sorry, we just, let, 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 sorry, Nikki. We've actually I... discussed it. That even though he might have got positive feedback, if he was actually looking at his own performances, he shouldn't, shouldn't have been happy. With the decision? No, with his own form. With his own form. But uh, t- setting aside the phone call, probably is really minor. I mean, I emphasise it because I don't think it, I don't think that's great communication. But I think that that's minor in the great scheme of things. Surely, surely the issue here is that a player is being t- given positive feedback and told that he's at his form's building after getting the negative feedback in round one. Surely the issue becomes that you, you're leading a player to believe that he's building and he's doing the right things, and then he's dropped. No, I, I don't. I don't think that's the oh, issue. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, why, yeah. Pete? They're men. They're grown men. It's a football club. Yeah. It happens all the time. But where's but, the where's the, where's the, where's the uh, proper communication? No, but, well, what no, do you mean? But the, we're only getting his side of the story here. Like the proper communication, uh, like his form might have been building, but it still might not have been good enough to be in the side. Mm. Oh, I'll let, I'll let it roll up. Obviously, I'm in the minority, but 
I thought it stank to high heaven. It is a fair indication of of where we're at as a, as, as a club, mm. but that's just me. No, actually, no, I what I, a club would have been thrilled about it either. What I think stinks out. to high heaven is what Bryce has done. Why would you come out in the media in round four and say that? Well, that's that's my next point. I'm sure the club wouldn't be happy with him coming out and saying that. No. So, you know, that's it just seems to be, you know, we, we, we had a whole lot of media last night about, you know, uh, the state of the club and uh, that looks to be a significant disconnect. Uh, I think it's it's pretty clear from well from an outsider's point of view, um, it's pretty clear that, um, that something's going on there because the players aren't mm. playing with any sort of passion, any sort of commitment. Um, they're being lazy. They're not running. They're not working hard enough. You know, you name it. They're not doing it. Um, they're not a club that is uh, uh, united. All as on far the same page. No, that's right. No. Anyway, sorry, moving on from that one. I won't get bogged down in that one. So moving on from that one, uh, good, the good news today, Darcy Fogarty off of his um, SNFL imposed suspension. So he's available for selection on the weekend. Um, source, Jacob's not available for selection. That knee's uh, still troubling. Um, and the other one relative to Crows was the Luke McDonald appeal. Did not uh, get up and he still will take his, um, his one-match suspension. Um, what did you think of that one as compared to the Setterfield suspension? I, I, as soon as the Setterfield one happened, I was, I, I thought to myself, that's got to be, if they're serious and they're feeding him, it's got to be two or three. And so three with an early plea down, to, sorry, two with an early plea um, seems sort of reasonable. What did you think about the McDonald decision? Nick? Um, it, it's consistent with the way the AFL is going about it and what we discussed last week, which is all about the injury that was actually occurred and the fact that um, Chase is no chance. Or, well, no, he's not no chance, but um, it, the club actually has said it's, you know, he may un- may miss this week from that concussion. Now, the fact that McDonald, uh, McDonald's um, lawyer argued that he also possibly sustained whiplash, which in the incident which, you know, could have compounded the, the concussion issues and not just the hit. It's once again that whole thing of the AFL being reactive about protecting the head, et cetera, and sacrosanct. So to me it was a bit more of that football collision. He was a bit late. All of us who have played football, you know you try to make your opponent earn it. And he, and he did instinctively duck because he knew it was coming. Um, but it's it's consistent for once um, with the match review panel and the tribunal that what they do regarding the head being sacrosanct. I just think Who? there's an ongoing inconsistency, personally. Yeah, I, I thought, I mean, I you know, as I, and I was at the, I didn't, I only had half an eye at the game because I was out, but it was on in the background. But um, it looked to me that uh, that he was taken off as a result of that incident. He was out with the, the rest of the game with concussion. And so I, I guess, Fina, I tend to agree with you. Are you talking about the Setterfield one where you've got a, another incident where the, yeah. the player goes off with concussion, so he gets two games and, yeah. and you know they're out of the game? So you know, why the difference? Well, there, there was no difference. Yeah, that's, in terms in terms exactly. of the uh, the result, there was no difference. You know, a player got yeah, hit. A player haven't... got hit late. Both missed the rest of the game. Simple. Mm-hmm. So there's no consistency. Yeah, that, that is kind of it. Yeah, that is interesting. There, I have I actually haven't seen the set of a one because I actually missed um, a lot of the games on the weekend, so I can't talk to you know what are the the severity etc. of it is because that's often what they base it on. As it to was whether it's medium or high impact. It, Nick, and Chase it was, your, was classed as medium. It was your classic pin the arms and ch- and and, uh, and tackle the guy to oh, the ground. Oh, sling. And, yeah. And sling yeah, they, that, no, they are actually more con- – they are very concerned about that. But it's no because different. Because the player can't protect – can't play. Yeah, I know, but that's the way that they're thinking, Nikki. though. So, in a way, they're actually being consistent about it. Nikki, have you ever you. been punched in the back of the head? You can't protect yourself from uh, that one either. Not for long. 
No, you can't. But it's the way their thinking goes. So they're consistent in their thinking. I'm not saying their thinking is right. And the other one that was uh, a little bit controversial was the Paddy Dangerfield one. Um, another one of these <laughs> where they, they're dishing out fines for intentional acts, which I think is pretty ordinary. Uh, did anybody ever think he was going to get a game? <laughs> of course not. And not be in contention for a brown line? No, nah, he'd have to do something pretty pretty severe to get a match. Yeah. If they let Selwood get away with what he's been getting away with for years, Dangerfield could do a whole lot worse than that. Yeah. And the, if, go, looking around the the uh, the AFL itself, uh, the highlight for me in watching games on the weekend was I don't know if either of you caught the uh, the, the Gold Coast Carlton game, which was a pretty uh, horrific game of football to watch. But of course, you were all uh, we're all barracking for whoever Carlton is playing, and uh, <laughs> so I did have an eye on it uh, on Sunday, and um, just a, a just a delicious little bit of irony there when. Um, Mitch McGovern came back onto the ground and was put the, as the loose man in defence. And did you see it, Fiend at all? No, I didn't see the game, but I did. He- I did hear. It was just. It was just delicious. He was. Uh, he was the loose man in defence for the last minute or so, and and uh, when when there was a sort of a, a scramble for the ball about twenty metres out from the Gold Coast goal, and and McGovern was doing the right thing. He was back in the goal square, but as the as the ball kind of just continued to sort of. Uh, scrum forward and, and across the um, – he got sucked up into the play. Yeah. And then, of course, what happened is that the uh, snap came over his head, yep. he bounced in the goal square and bounced through for a goal. It was a, it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> we right. don't hold grudges. We don't hold all. grudges, but <laughs> the fact that it was McGovern and the fact that it was Carlton, it was just a – it was a great thing. Delicious irony. Yeah. It was. It was. It was it's, great. Any, anything from anyone else? Uh, we'll uh, see yeah, the... so there, there is the AFLW news. Um, that we've actually offered uh, two-year contracts and been accepted for Anne Hatcher, Chloe Shear, uh, Eloise Jones, and Danny Van Hagen. So essentially, the band gets back together. Band's back together next year. Pretty much, and Renee Fourth, who we knew about, so she um, was not going to go to West Coast, although her partner is um, Justin Mules and Hannah Martin, and um, have all three of those have the one-year deal for next year, and Alicia Considine will be back as an international rookie. So that's really lovely. Uh, the other thing is it's highly likely we're about to get um, the bulk of the squad also signed up because most of them have been in Bali enjoying themselves. So we have to wait till they're back to actually sign the paperwork. Very good. Um, and see, the Crows have already announced that uh, Source won't be available this week again but with no return in sight. So it's still got that meniscus issue. So uh, I assume that they're just going to keep sticking with Riley until uh, until Source is ready to go again. Yeah, that would seem to be how it's going to go. They've, I think, they've, um, you know, they they need to back him in, and it would be uh, difficult to look at alternative options. I think after only giving him a couple of games. So uh, um, yeah, I, I agree. They'll, they'll persist. They'll persist. I think with uh, with Riley. And, and what do you think, Pete? I thought he improved somewhat. Uh, over his first up game, yeah, I thought I thought that it, you know he wasn't he wasn't uh, too bad. I mean, I see Goldstein got into the you know got into the coaches' votes, so he obviously yeah. had a reasonable game. But I think you know, I mean, we're expecting a lot of Riley, and I think that that you know, and, and none of this is on him for me. I mean, you know, I'm sure that you've made mention of this that you know this 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 picture that we're in now. This has been available for viewing you know, for the last probably three or four years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there is, uh, if you look at 20, you know, 20, probably 16, 17, 18, why it is that there weren't um, particularly chosen games for Source to sit out for two or three games here or there so that they can gradually give, you know, O'Brien a few games so that when we got to this point where he was injured, which we knew we would always get to, and he is out for half of six or seven games, that, you know, O'Brien's got, you know, maybe – at least 20 games under his belt, you know? It just makes far too much sense, Pete. Like you're making far um, too much sense. So here's something interesting. Uh, Simon Moyle in the chat said that Scott last night on 360, they targeted Rob directly for free kicks. So that means they were actually faking. 
which is exactly what we thought with Ben Brown. Well, yeah, I think he deserves a logie for that. And I'm I'm sorry, but you you shouldn't actually say that's good coaching. That's actually that's actually poor umpiring. Oh, I agree. I don't think anyone would. I mean, you know, I don't. I mean, is, is it is it good coaching? Well, you know, I guess it's good if they if they get away with it and they get an advantage from it. Then I guess maybe it's good coaching. But certainly, you're spot on. It's actually just poor umpiring to be sucked into it, unless they're genuine free kicks, which they didn't appear to be. No, most of them didn't seem to be. Not in my opinion, anyway. But you know, by the same token, he's a, he's a rookie ruckman, and and uh, as we said on Sunday night, Nick. Um, you know, Goldstein might not be quite the quality he was a couple of years ago, but uh, he's still a wily old ruckman, and uh, they use that to their advantage. Goldstein had 17-odd touches and had an impact on the game, and as you mentioned, Pete got coaches' votes and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, not silly. No, absolutely not. And uh, just for Sensible Crow, and I haven't seen Sensible Crow in our chat before, um, uh, just a comment about the uh, potential inside discontent about Brett Burton. Well, probably if we'd had Mackie here tonight, he'd probably <laughs> he'd probably <laughs> we'd have a couple of dickheads up. already going straight away. <laughs> dickheads are already going. So. Back is on next week. <laughs> so certainly no inside info on that one, um, Sensible Crow. But uh, I think that you know all the stuff that happened last year. I guess it's uh, certainly a fair chance that that's the case. Well, without any further ado, because there's not a hell of a lot of other news going around, let's actually talk about last week's match, shall we? Pete, what do you reckon? Um, any chance, uh, what do you think? Um, I'll spit it out in a minute. Any chance of uh, having a chat about the twos, perhaps? Did you want to have a chat about the twos? We can a- start with See? the twos. I, I, told, I told you on Friday night. Um, on Sunday night feed that I, I was pretty sure that Pete was actually at the game and he'd be really happy and wanted to talk about the SNFL. Uh, unfortunately, I, I was going to go, um, Nikki, but a couple of things sort of got in the way and I ended up pass. not going. But I, but I, do, have the, I do have the pass um, and so I watched the whole game um, via streaming. So I did see the game um, on, on TV. So uh, you were at the game? I was at the game. There were, there were very vocal like, about six or seven of us just sitting in a row and we were having a great time in the last half about how quiet the Eagles supporters were. <laughs> they're usually reasonably tamed down there anyway, the uh, the Eagles supporters. Might yeah, they're not too bad, but they anyway. did go very, very silent in that <laughs> third quarter. So it was a, it was a really, really, uh, you know, as uh, it would be obvious, it was a really, really positive display and um, certainly um, it was inspired by the engine room. You had um, obviously Patrick Wilson, um uh, Hugh Greenwood and Bryce Gibbs, who I thought all had excellent games. Um, what, what, what were your thoughts on those three? And then probably to a lesser degree, Jordan Gallucci as well, who I also thought played very well, but didn't quite get as much of the ball as the other three did. Uh, for me, Gibbs was, I think it took him a little bit to get into the, the pace of the game and working with those other particular midfielders and the way you, have, you work in the SNFL. So his second half was a lot better. Um, I thought Greenwood had a great time just absolutely bullying every single Eagles player that came near him. He's just like, I'm stronger than you. You can't tackle me. And it was a delight to watch. He looked um, huge out there, didn't he? Oh, he did. It he was massive. <laughs> and he was just like, they're trying to tackle him. And he just keep running going, mm, you're going to lose. Um, for Go- To me, Gooch was just doing Gooch things. Um, he was playing more of a half forward wing role. Mm. Um, so he, he was a bit more of that that outside, but I I just thought he's just quality, and we know he shows better when he's got the better players around him. Um, for that type of player, you, that's that's kind of um, what you think. Um, who was the other one you were talking about? Uh, Pat Wilson. Oh, he was outstanding. Mm. His um, delivery into the forward line and, and Greenwoods as well. Um, was uh, the, I think that's one of the best games I've seen him play. Can I ask he a was question? Doing a lot longer kicks. Yeah. Ask a question. Why are we playing Patrick Wilson in the middle? He plays in the middle and on the wing. He kind of swaps a little bit there, but 
um, for the SNFL uh, with what we've got because Paholki went out. Normally he's more on the wing, which is where we would play him in the SNFL team, but with Paholki out, um, et cetera, McHenry, that kind of meant that we needed that bigger body as well around that, that midfield structure what? that we like to have. Why would we play him on a wing? Because that's where he normally plays. For who? That's where he's always played for us. When he came in for the AFL game, he played on the wing. No, he didn't. Played half forward. Played half, half back, I think. Didn't he? Or half no, forward. played no, half he forward. he was on the wing as well. No. No, my point is that there's no point having Patrick Wilson playing in the guts because he's never going to play there in the AFL side. So what's the point? What are we trying to do? I don't know. Ask the coaches. That's well, no, the, this is an the, opinion the, show, so I'm asking your opinion. <laughs> well, in the two years that we've had him, that's where I've seen him play. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not I saying that... I saw him when he played against Hawthorne. He did play on the wing as well as across half back. Mm, no, nah, he didn't. Um, the thing is that we've got too much of this going on in the SANFL team, and it's great to have good results and all the rest of it, but uh, are we actually trying to groom players for the positions that we want the want them to play in the AFL when they come in or are we trying to win a game of SANFL football? Oh, I have my doubts, Fiend. I, I mean, I have my doubts. I, I thought he played a terrific game on the weekend. I certainly wouldn't take anything away from him, but I've certainly oh, got my nothing, doubts. Nothing against Paddy. As to whether he... Um, no, no, no I, know, I know what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying. But um, I, I don't think he's a AFL player. That, that's just my, my read, my opinion. And I wonder whether, you know, we do, um, you know, um, a player like him, we've got him in the in the middle there to uh, to at least try and generate the ball going our way. And so, because we have got, um, you know, to my way of thinking, we've got a number of um, certainly players in our forward line who are on the, I would think, you know, on the cusp in the next probably six to twelve months of of transitioning to the A grade. And um, so, you want them to get as much opportunity as you can. So, also, not necessarily about, yeah. You know, I mean, winning games was probably a um, um, a, a, a byproduct of of how the midfield was um, was going, but it meant that the uh, the forwards were getting plenty of ball in, which was which was good. I think that the point is well made in respect of Darcy Fogarty in particular. I mean, that is that to me is just a. I, I just you know I'm just lost for words about what's going on there, and to see him out there <clears throat> as frustrated as he was, you know, giving away you know 25 meter penalties for abusing umpires. Getting himself reported, he's a, he is a frustrated young man, and um, I, you know I don't know what you thought, Nick, but I, I just I cannot see what is going on with him, and they just look to me to be really you know just playing with his career a, a little bit, and uh, it looks a bit it looks all a bit cruel to me. Um, I actually even I've been quite harsh on him in the back lines for the the past two weeks, but this week I was actually quite pleased with his game, particularly in that that third quarter when they did try and get a bit of a trying to get it into their forward line, et cetera, he just seemed to have the ball on a string and was like, nah, balls staying out there. And he was showing that the absolute talent that he actually has. We finally actually had somebody in who was bigger than him who can take those bigger SNFL full forwards, which it's just not his go. So we actually had a, um, a full back. And so he was released to be a lot more proactive out of the back lines than having to be that last line of defence. Um, it's He's not the only player in our team who's given away, who gets a bit frustrated with the umpires in the SNFL. To, so I don't think it's more so much that he's frustrated about where he's playing. I think that's just frustration with the way we sometimes get umpired, which isn't fair. Well, where did um, Gallucci play? play? But I do, uh, Gooch was, he was sometimes in the midfield, but he was that outside midfielder, a bit across half forward. I'm not sure if I saw him on the wing at times. Well, we played Gooch was, in the guts. He was, he was at times. Yeah, at times. He, had some spe- he did have some spells in the midfield, yeah. 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 But you, but who would you rather see in there, uh, Patrick Wilson or Jordan Gallucci? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with the point that you're making. I really do, and and um, you know, you'd rather see 
Gallucci spend more time in the guts, but to, I guess depending on what they think that his role is going to be when he eventually he norm- elevates. He normally does in the SNFL because we, we've had like him and Paholke have been the staples in the midfield um, what, in, the at guts. a SNFL level. Yeah. Yeah, they, they normally do. Um, but I, I did notice that he was um, being swapped with the forward line a bit because that's, I mean, that's what we've we've mostly played him in the AFL. But my opinion watching his game was that it's, I'd say it's pretty strong that he could be in the AFL team this week. I would certainly I think, hope I think, so. I think Greenwood definitely. Greenwood definitely. And I, the one I'd have thing, Gibbs straight back in as well. The one thing I want to see is Himmelberg. Piss yeah, off JJ absolutely. and put him back in. He was leading at the ball. And now I actually said this on the Sunday cast, um, Pete, but I, I'd be interested to see if you kind of had that same feeling because watching the SNFL, I get a kind of, if that's before the AFL team plays, you kind of get a feel for how the AFL team is going to play. Um, and I felt quite positive about the North game because of, that forward line movement we had going, we were actually kicking to the advantage of our forwards. They were actually running with proper forward leading patterns. They were leading at the ball carrier. Oh, look, Fina, something that we've been talking about, you know, for quite some time, and I know that you're hot on it. It's just, it's just having an aerial presence, an aerial threat. And the, the thing about, in particular, the third quarter when the uh, the twos really got on a roll. It was the it was the way Himmelberg in particular, um, and um, and and Ben Davis as well because he, he was uh, Ben Davis was um, he did a disappearing act in the first half, um, second half he was excellent, uh, but Himmelberg in that third quarter, the, I mean he took nine marks overall, and in the third quarter in particular it wasn't just him taking marks there was a number of times where he got into position, and you know spilled the mark or didn't quite take it but just his presence and his competing. Yeah, you know, I can think of two or three goals um, that uh, Wright, Matty Wright got, and certainly Greenwood got, which was which was actually a um, which was a Himmelberg um, missed the mark, but then follow up, still contest, get the ball, handball out, and get it to Greenwood uh, for a direct assist. Um, he, he was just, you know, he was uh, quite he was amazing. He was fantastic, and I know he only kicked two goals himself. He could have had more if he kicked accurately, but it was just that aerial threat and he was taking two or three defenders with him um, each time and that just, you know, it, I mean, it's just, you know, footy 101, isn't it? You take two or three defenders with you because they were worried about him and um, and that just, that, that, that helped, you know, Matty Wright, it helped um, Stengel and it helped Greenwood when he was up forward as well. So, and as I said, to a lesser extent, Ben, extent ben Davis, well, he took five marks in the second half. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's 13 marks, uh, sorry, 14 marks between them, between yeah. those two. In, you know, basically, um, it, it is a threat and that's just something we don't have in the first team. Well, well does it, the, does... SNF, the SNFL coaches actually sat on Petrenko and sat on number 52, the little redhead Viking dude, I should remember his name, who's actually quite good on the half forward line for the Eagles. And once we did that, that co- that stopped very much their run. And that then allowed us to control the play a bit better. But one thing I do want to talk about, which I didn't get to um, on Sunday, was McHenry. Um, in that first quarter when the ball was continually living in the Eagles forward line, there was a ball up near where I was sitting and all of a sudden I just hear this voice just yelling out, come on boys, let's get this ball out of here and down where it belongs. And it's McHenry, you know, and he's jigging up his teammates. So there's this 18 year old kid who's been the loudest voice on the field, trying to G everybody up going, you know, they've, they've been getting the ball in, they've been getting it out, but get stuck at half forward. It comes back in again. It comes back out again. And, and I know, when I've played that that's pretty demoralizing when you're a defender and he's doing this loud enough, you know, to, so the defenders to hear the ball contest that happens. He's the one that gets it and just bangs it on his boot and gets it out of there. So he's doing this leadership quality, 18 years of age, but then he's going in and getting the ball himself, which I was quite impressed with. 
Just getting back to what you were saying before, Pete, about because um, yep. <laughs> we kind of yeah, just I had to get that in. well, you could have waited a second. Um, <laughs> it, the thing that what happens when you've got marking presence up forward, Pete, you'd know this, and Nick, you'd know this. Not only does it make the opposition accountable, uh, it also gives a little bit of confidence to the blokes putting the ball in because they don't have to be pinpoint perfect with their forward entries. You know, if if they know that their their forwards are going to compete in the air and make a contest, then it takes a little bit of pressure off them in terms of their delivery, and often that leads to better delivery anyway. Um, and in and you know delivery to better positions on the park. So we do need someone like uh, Himmelberg to you know split a lead up the middle and and just make a bit of presence because at the moment we're not getting any of that from JJ. Nothing, nothing no, at all. I'm not a not a brass riser. You know, I think um, uh, for me um, probably Benny Davis. You know, he he suffers really for the fact that he disappeared in the first half. I mean, if he puts those two halves together, he could have had something special on the weekend. But I think he he just puts himself back in the queue a little bit because of that disappearing act in the first half. But for for a, an overall performance, I think the Berg had I think he only had thirteen possessions, but he had nine marks and and uh, two goals, three, and you know could have had. I mean, that could have been a really special day if he if he'd kicked four. Um, and then, you know, Stengel, two goals, five, um, and I think 14, 15 possessions. And so, uh, and, and, you know, Davis himself, I mean, that second half, he had 15 possessions, five marks. Yeah, um, playing high you know, half They're really, four. yeah, really influential numbers and, and yeah. no coincidence that, that, that we, you know, we, we banged on six or seven goals. And so, you know, I've been banging on about it for a long time, but those two in particular, you know, uh, Himmelberg and Davis, they just keep, Keep, you know, keep getting it done at SNFL level. They've been they got it done all last year, and yet you know, apart from one game for Himmelberg, um, it just seems it just feels like they're just nowhere near it, well, and yet they continue to impress it at, at state league level. Well, the two obvious uh, replacements uh, for them are, are JJ and T Lynch. Uh, T Lynch has started mm. to get a little bit of the ball, but he's nowhere near effective, and he's not hitting the scoreboard, and he doesn't present as a marking option. He's very much that conduit. Uh, it's it's obvious if if the club is selecting on form, then um, Ben Davis and Himmelberg and Himmelberg in. needs to get. Well, they just both need to be in. Ben Davis has has been running around long enough. We know what we're going to get from him, and we yeah. need we need to inject that that uh, that X factor that that change in the dynamic in the forward line. We need to inject that in order to get some results. Tyson Stengel's another. You know, Lockie yep. Murphy hasn't been bad. Betts was all right, but, it was, but they're playing Betts very high at the moment. Um, but Stingle just has to be in there. He obviously can find the goals. Who's eating? He can obviously find the goals. Um, and he applies a little bit of pressure. We've just got to get him in. We're not kicking enough goals at the moment. You know, we're 20-odd mm. we're points down on our, on our uh, desired output every, every week. Uh, 20, 20 to 25 points down. So... They've just, I mean, they've just got to make these changes now. What, like, you know, my impression is, Pete, that we know what we're going to get from the people we've already got in there. There's no improvement left in these blokes. And it appears to me yeah. that some of these blokes are starting to fall off a cliff a little bit. We're going to make mm. some hard decisions. And Ben Davis and Himmelberg and a couple of others have done a long apprenticeship. Gallucci is another one, done a long apprenticeship. And I just think it's time that the coaching staff trusted these guys as the next generation, that's why we that's why we drafted them, and that's mm. why we've kept them on the list. So now it's time to actually throw some faith behind those kids, and get them in, and you know, inject some enthusiasm into the place. I just don't want us to get another you've been, you've been another Harry Deer situation. We yeah, just, we killed his goes, career. We, we never ever knew what Harry Deer was capable of, really, no. did we? No, we didn't. Um, and so I, I think that, we, you know, it would be a disappointment if we didn't. Uh, Nick, just a quick word on Ned McHenry. I, 20 possessions and um, I know he ended up with a concussion and um, no doubt that he had plenty of leadership out there. I don't know. I, I just felt that for me um, there was a lot of fancy footwork, a lot of dancing around, a lot of uh, balking and good stuff like that. It looked pretty. I wasn't sure there was a lot of hurt factor with Ned and I'm, that's probably being, you know, pretty harsh. But um, just didn't look to me to be um, uh, particularly penetrating or creative with, yeah, you know, in terms not, of finishing off his work. He's but, not quite <clears throat> there yet, 
but there's, as you said, there's promise that we can see mm. where he can get better. Because this is quite a, a – the SNFL is a big step up, step up from the under-18s. Yeah, sure. Um, but the, the fact that he's playing quite well. But to me, the, the most impressive one is Shoal. Um, oh, yes. How do we forget to talk is, about him? My goodness, Mayfane. Now, is if, this kid a If this you're talking about play? hurt factor. Jeez. That kid's got hurt factor. Goodness me, 34 and then 25 again last week. And we don't get their DE um, at state league level. I'm not sure if you've seen it, Nikki, but it, to the naked eye, he just uses the ball beautifully every time. I think he the just, club said it was something ridiculous, like 94%. You know, and he's just cutting the SNFL to pieces. So just, he has to be in. Well, why, well, you know, if we're feed income, if, you know, I mean, Don sits up there and says, you know, this is a merit-based system. Well, unless you're, unless you're just staring down the barrel and telling lies, how can a guy that get against, you know, against Glenelg, who are a quality outfit, Glenelg, will, they'll give it a shake this year, the Bays. They're a very good side. They've got 34 positions yeah. and just made it look simple. He is just a pure footballer. I don't care how big he is. I don't care how, whether he hasn't got much meat on his bones. I couldn't give a shit. He is playing against men. And he is caning them, yep. and um, and he did the same against the Eagles. He, he he just he finds the ball, and he finds space, and he uses the ball. Yeah, and I think I've the fact problem. that he backed that up means that he should be he should be in the queue now. I mean, you could forgive the selectors for going, okay, well that's one game. Let's see how the next how he backs up. And the fact that he's backed up now, just considering the dead wood we've got in the AFL team, it, it just needs, needs to come in. Nikki, the only thing that worries me is that, you know, we've seen what he can do. Now, I, I'd be very, very surprised if now at SNFL level the opposition teams didn't start sitting on him and, and that and that potentially could affect his uh, his numbers and the way that he, you know, and, and a kid at that age after playing only a few games suddenly having to deal with a tag, I wouldn't be surprised if they sit on him. I think they were actually trying in the Eagles game. Well, uh, well um, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't notice yeah. it. I was watching on TV, but... They they were trying to – his player was trying to keep him out a bit wider, but he was just like, no, nah, stop you. Um, I'm going to go and be the link running through. And because he's got that nice burst of speed that he can then maintain, um, so he gets how, that nice little break. How did he drop as far as he did in the draft? I'm, you know, just Because he played more country. But I, mm. I think other – there were quite a few – like somebody said that Wells was after him. We know that North were so pissed off that we took him before their pick, um, just before them. Um, it, I think it was because they were all hoping there were such, such other good kids in the draft and he's a half-backer and they tend to be later in the draft anyhow. Yeah, I suppose that's fair, that's a fair comment. So I, th- saying, I think it, that's it, where it came a, from. You know, so to me, come, so I guess summing up, you know, the guys that really have to seriously be considered are um, obviously Greenwood, um, Gibbs, uh, Gallucci, Himmelberg, and Scholl. Uh, I, I, and Dave is probably just at the just slightly the next rung un, underneath that. Yeah, For I me, think the, prob- the problem is that why we won't bring Scholl in is that these are he's a half backer, and we've got those half backers of Laird. Smith and Miller are who we love. No, he comes oh, in for Kelly. Touch. He comes in for Kelly every oh, yeah. day of the week. I know, but he, I know he should. But they but won't. They won't. They won't because no, they're not, not picking defences to actually match up on the forward line that they're playing. That's why yeah. Hardigan is still in the bloody team. Yeah. Well, we, if you're going, if you're serious about this, you pick your defence for the forward line you're going to be playing. Not try and make the forward line fit your defence. There's no behemoths that play for Gold Coast. Yeah. And there's, there's no reason at all. There's absolutely no reason at all that he shouldn't be selected. If they are fair income, Bring Rocky Scholl should be playing. Um, and Himmelberg should be playing. And the other three, the, th- the three Gs I mentioned, they should all be playing as well. There should be five changes. Oh, I, and the other thing, and, I reckon seven. Sorry, go on. I reckon seven, but anyway. Look, I, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. Um, I think the five that are, are at a minimum because you still could put Ben Davis in. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, I think if you couldn't argue with the following players coming out, Pete, you couldn't argue with um, 
D Mac, Atkins, Lynch, Jenkins, Kelly, Hardigan, and CY coming out. You couldn't argue with any no. of those. No. Um, or Murphy. Or, or Murphy. Murphy would be on the cusp. I reckon Riley Knight's another one who's skating on thin yep. ice. Uh, just doesn't get enough of it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so there's opportunities there. And I think if they're, like you said, if they're fair dinkum, they need to start picking on form because this isn't working. And I think some of the senior players, tell me this, tell me this, and this is, sorry, a bit of a diversion, but how is Josh Jenkin in our team's leadership group? How does that happen? Are they, well, are they player selected or are they they're appointed? Play, no, they're player yeah. selected. Mm. So what do our players value? Because if I, if I was looking at um, Jenkins on the field as, as a teammate, the last person I'd want to be led by is Josh Jenkins at the moment. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, particularly after the weekend's performance. He just looked disinterested. You know, after all this time on the list, he's, he's in a leadership position and he plays like that. He's playing arrogant. He's lazy. He's not, he's not presenting. He wants the ball mm. given to him on a silver platter um, and generally in a, in a manner that requires the least amount of work for him to do to be able to get it. Um, he, yep. squ- he squibs on leads uh, at crucial times. Um, how, how's, how's this bloke... Uh, what did our players see in Josh Jenkins that they decided they wanted to elevate him into a leadership position? Well, I guess that's something that you know because we you know we don't we're not in the inner sanctum we we you know we can't know um, so w- whether it's off field whether whether I mean it may well be that they're looking to try and get a good tip on the trots um, something like that you yep. know they could be um, they could be you know there could be seven or eight of them that looking to go into a syndicate with a with a trotting horse or something like that well then JJ's your man he's all over it but uh, other than that no I I, I Cannot imagine why he would be in the leadership group. I, I don't think our blokes are serious. I don't think they're serious. They're not playing like they're serious. I, I think, I think there's a few in that in that squad, Pete, in the senior group that think the the moment's passed for them. I, mm. I think I think 2017 demoralised our senior players, uh, and 2018 might have been less about peripheral things and more about attitude. Um, and because what we're seeing is more of the same in terms of attitude this year for no particular reason. Apparently they were a happy group at pre-season. Um, I, so I just, I just think they're shot, and I think the coaching staff need to see that, and the coaching staff need to make hard calls for the, for the good of the club. Yep. yep. That's how I see it. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I, the, the thing that I, the thing that I find frustrating is is that it's not like we haven't got people um, in the twos that that, that can't um, that haven't got the potential to take that step. Now, yep. if they start if they start tipping out, you know, six or seven, um, you know, uh, older players, well, then the immediate thought is going to be that well, okay, we're we're rebuilding. We've got no chance of playing finals now. We just have to suck to that. But you know what? Who knows? Who knows what an injection of players like that will do i mean to me you know the likes of great say if you, if you put in greenwood gallucci and gibbs well that's that should be part of your first 22 anyway that they've yeah. just been you know so i don't think you lose anything certainly by those three coming in and um you know see why you know murphy and i don't know well jones will come out with concussion yeah um so that you don't lose anything by making those three changes at least. No. But then you you, you, you want to try and inject some, you know, so, I mean, you, you read about it all the time. I mean, I you know, heard um, uh, Travis Spoke interviewed the other day and just to saying, you know, what, what it does, you know, for the senior players. To, it just gets you, gets you, it regenerates your, your feel for the game but when you get these younger players who are coming in and snapping at your heels. Yeah. And it, it brings a whole fresh, attitude to the team and so who, who knows what you can achieve yeah i mean nikki you said before that ned mchenry was uh, around chirping around the packs and geeing up yeah. and, all, and that's great that's fantastic but why weren't our it, senior players was... doing that you know that's that's what it, that's yeah. i guess what i'm talking about you get a bloke like ned who who, who wants to make every post a winner obviously he's, he's obviously that kind of kid um, and he's the one doing all the chirping around the packs. It's not a Bryce Gibbs or a, or a Patrick Wilson or, you know, blokes that have been in the system for a while. It's, an, it's the new kid. 
And you put that sort of stuff in amongst mm. some uh, talented but perhaps a bit jaded senior players and all of a sudden they're up and about again because it, it mm. injects enthusiasm into the group. But also, as you said, when we discussed this on Sunday about the recent grand final teams, they've all got youth as well as the experience. And the youth, they're playing in the right position. Yeah. That, and that comes back to play. And that, I guess that's what I was trying to get at earlier, Nick, that we're, we're playing some, some kids in positions that they shouldn't be playing in because you, we brought in Miles Pahoki. We didn't play him as, as a midfielder who, who, could, um, who could hit the scoreboard. Miles didn't have a role. He just ran around sort of high half forward and hoped for the best and... But, you know, we need to be playing Gallucci in the middle because when he gets promoted to the AFL team, he needs to be playing in the middle uh, or at least in that midfield rotation. You know, we need to be placing our faith in these kids when we put them in, not playing them uh, sort of left, right out. You know, Chase Jones, he just needs to be played in the middle. I know he's a slip of a kid, but we've seen that he doesn't share. Yeah. We've seen that yep. he runs in straight lines. We've seen that he's got a hunger for the contest and he's a he tackling runs machine. He the right positions. Yeah. So you play him in the guts. That's what we recruited him for. You play him yeah. in the guts. There's enough yep. room for, for uh, senior and, and rookie talent in that rotation. Just play him where he's supposed to play. And, and, and the thing is, Fane, is that what you want is, is, is you want him to be cutting his teeth in that midfield when he's got you know, the Crouches and Sloanes around with their exactly. bodies to protect him. Exactly. And w- otherwise, you know, what you're going to end up getting is you're going to in- end up getting, you know, two th- again, we're going to be back here at two or three years' time with, you know, guys like Sloan falling off a cliff and, you know, we just haven't exposed these guys. Yeah, and we'll it's be just, saying, you know, gee, he was so promising. What happened? <clears throat> and that's because yeah, he's right. played three years in a forward pocket. You know, where he's not where he's not learning anything about playing AFL midfield. He's not seeing other players. He's not seeing opponents. The, the education that, that um, he can get from watching some of the, the elite midfielders, uh, you know, yeah, from close them. up, it's not just about what he gets from our blokes, but what he gets from blokes yeah. like Cripps and Dusty Martin and those blokes, you know, that's all part of his education. He's not going to get that if he's playing a forward pocket. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, is anyone going to be concerned if we, you know, don't win a flag this year but we've given 10 games to half a dozen of those guys? Of course not. It was a very interesting not. question no. posted on Big Footy a little while back. Uh, While well, it was a debate between would you would you rather have, uh, you know, a, a season where we kind of ran the mark and all the rest of it and sort of finish fifth or sixth or would you rather have a season where we finish you know, 14th or 15th, but you could see the talent being brought in and you could see the, the, the path ahead and you could see the plan and you could see these kids develop. I, I'd rather watch us finish 15th if I could see some of the juniors coming through because they're the next generation. And as far as mm. I'm concerned at the moment, this squad in terms of the current preferred 22 is done. It's done. We might, we're flogging a dead horse at this point. Yeah, I couldn't just uh, shout out to Macker. I couldn't agree more, Fang. I could not agree more. <laughs> you know, and look, it makes you want to... Um, someone gave me some info uh, during the week um, and without going into detail about it, we've we've talked about this as well over the last couple of weeks. The fact that the, the club decided to put uh, that coaching panel together around Don Pike... It really is, it smacks of indifference. And it has to be Brett Burton. He's the general manager of the football department, right? So around, yep. around the bloke that we bring in to take our club to premiership glory, we put in, uh, you know, two SNFL rookies and a bloke that we didn't really want um, and a bloke and a half who have been there for 100 years. You know, what is going on with our coaching box? And the problem is now, and this is, this is kind of what the person was alluding to that was, that was telling me, we've got Scott Camperelli in the senior assistant role. Now, if you compare those roles at other clubs, before Fagan went to, to Brisbane, he was um, Clarkson's right-hand man. Well, he was exclusively Clarkson's right-hand man. So Clarkson would use him to bounce off ideas and all the rest of it. 
Don Pike's not able to use Campo that way because Campo's too busy teaching the new blokes in the coaches box how to be AFL coaches. So mm. Don Don is sort of is a bit of a lone wolf in in the coaches box because his right hand man, the bloke that's supposed to be his his devil's advocate, if you like, is too busy looking after the new kids on the block. You know, uh, the, it's it's a terrible coaching box, and I think that it's showing in the way that we're playing because our, our system and our ball movement and our transition um, and the players' confidence in what they're trying to do or being asked to do, is, it's, just, it's just completely shot. And I, I think a lot points back to the, the personnel and the composition of that coach's box. And when you, when, you, when you think about the fact that Andrew Fagan wanted to put in best-in-class um, football department... It's an absolute disgrace that we... And it's nothing against the individuals. Marty Matna, a great coach. Mick Godden, good coach. You know, all of that. There's nothing against the individuals. But is it the right profile for a team that is, in terms of its, um, its player profile, its squad profile, its uh, premiership window, if you like, is it the right coaching panel to have around that group? I, I wouldn't mm-hmm. think so. No, and also I think you've just it's a it's a good point. It's actually a really, really good point that you make in terms of the profile and whether the coach fits the profile. And so I, I would envisage, you know, it's a very, very difficult thing for guys like, you know, Matner and Godden. And again, no disrespect to them. They've, you know, they've been, you know, they've coached in their own right. Suddenly they're thrown in with, you know, a whole lot of senior players who you know, I played in a grand final in 2017. Yeah. I've been there a long time. They're big. They're big guys. Big reputations. Big. You know. Um, and so that that's got to be. You know. It, it's not. It's not like they're coming in and coaching a team who's on the build no. and who's got a whole lot of young kids that need developing and you and you grow with them. It seems to me that you know um, they would have been better served with if they could have got him someone like a Ratten. Oh, had to be Ratten. You know, someone like that who 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 was a you know uh, another senior person who, you know, is not intimidated by that. Uh, uh, you know, maybe not intimidated is the right word, but you know what I'm trying to say. It just is, fits the profile a is tr- is is able to communicate like to uh, put an analogy or not an analogy, but an example. What's Mick Godden gonna gonna uh, teach Rory Sloan? Like, yeah, is Mick Godden's of no value to Rory Sloan? Whereas, whereas someone like a Brett Ratton would be so valuable as an in and under player himself to a Matt Crouch, a Brad Crouch, a Sloney, like he he knows yeah. Gibbs. So he, like, I just uh, and look, the simple fact is, you know, the Saints were were prepared to pay a bit for for Ratton, and as a result, look at their results this year. I know it's a bit of a yeah. topsy turvy start to the season, but the simple fact is. That Brett Ratton's come in and the Saints have started to win. Mm. Is it coincidence? Yep. I don't know. Imagine, imagine our coaching box if we'd had the two blokes that Pike really wanted, which would have been Sumich and Brett Ratton. So you yep. you you get rid of Camparelli and you put in a Brett Ratton as a senior assistant. And then you get rid of, I don't know, Ben Hart and you put in Peter Sumich as forward coach, right? All of a sudden, you've got all that experience in the coach's box. It doesn't expose Matna and Good and Godden as much, because there's all that experience around the box. And Pike has got enough experience next to him in Brett Ratton that he's got uh, he's got the ability to to bounce off ideas. And Ratton doesn't have to you know sit there and and change the nappies of the two new kids. It's it's completely the wrong profile, and it just it. It tells me that the club is not serious, because both those blokes were available for the right price. Mm. They were oh, Rat- simple Rat- as that. Was with with Clarko through the Hawthorne Hawk- Premiership years as well. Yep. I mean, what a what a box they had. They had Ratton, they had Fagan, they had bloody Clarkson. You wonder why they went top. So, if if St Kilda had to pay overs to get Ratton and were prepared to do it, why weren't we? able to pay overs for, for Brett Ratton. Because yeah, that's a good point. Why? Well, I mean, if anyone can give me a reason, I'd be happy to hear it, but I can't see why you wouldn't bring Brett Ratton into your organisation. 
and be prepared to pay him a couple of hundred grand over what he might otherwise have got. Why yep. wouldn't you? And the same with Simic. Sorry. Sorry. Same with same with Simic. It would have taken a little bit more. There's no good answer to it. No, would have taken a bit more coin to get Simic and Ratten over here. So why aren't why aren't we prepared to pay it? What are we spending that money on? Mm. Don't know. And and it's showing on the field. So I don't I I don't have any confidence now in the season because it's it's very clear now that um, the players just have lost confidence. Um, there's a there's a disconnect between the coaches and the players, the players that have faith in each other or the or the game plan, and I don't have a, a, any faith in the selection committee to inject the youth that's required to rejuvenate the playing group. So we're just going to get more of the same, in my opinion. As uh, as dim as that uh, outlook is, I can't um, I can't question it like this. I I don't I don't feel. Um, that we would do anything more this week other than look at a, a potentially Greenwood, Gallucci and Gibbs. They're the only three that would come into consideration. Um, that's just my my feel. And I, and in the coming weeks, I just don't, I don't know where. I mean, you would think that if we just continue to lose, that um, there'll, be, there'll come a point. But I don't know. I mean, you know, will it? Is there a point they'll move away from the established... Selection policies that they've got, that they're wedded to. Um, what and what will it take? What will it take? Well, it'll take us because being mathematic, is, mathematically out of the equation. It'll be too late then. Yeah, the problem is, is that, is that you know, they'll, and what what's always a problem is that they win enough games to uh, to keep themselves ensconced and keeping their tenure going. So they'll win on Sunday, and that'll keep the Wolves from the door for another two or three weeks because. They lose the week after. You've got to back him in because they won against Gold Coast. Don't be too sure they win this weekend. Gold Coast aren't going that bad. Oh, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think it'll be an easy. They've been. I mean, I saw them in full on Sunday, and I, they played some good football. And um, so, I don't think it'll be a pushover at all. I think that we'll get across. I think it'll be Eddie's three hundred. It'll be. I think that they'll cut, they'll get themselves up for that, and uh, I think that they'll win it. But I, I, I wouldn't think that they'd win by a lot. No. And doesn't that and give you? Wouldn't be surprised if we get rolled. Yeah, doesn't it give you an indication of where the club saw itself that was prepared to do that trade, uh, that pick deal, that pick swap with Carlton? So the club mm. clearly thought it was going to finish top half a dozen. Otherwise, you don't make yeah. that deal. You don't make that deal. Absolutely. So Absolutely. everyone down there has got ahead of themselves. Everyone, I think, thought it was just going to happen. That two at twenty eighteen was just an aberration. Everyone yep. was happy, joy. Everyone was good, uh, and it was just going to happen. They weren't willing to spend any money. They weren't willing to look at the game plan and rejuvenate it. Um, they weren't willing to inject youth, and here we are. And it's an indictment on the club. They just got ahead of themselves, and they've gotten too big for their own boots down there. And that's because there's not enough tension down there. Everyone just gets a spot. Everyone gets a job. Chappie gets another yeah. three years. It's not even. It's not even discussed. It's all tenure. It's all tenure. Exactly. You know, and and that's the culture of the Crows. I mean, we wanted to employ a bloody coach on that basis. You know, Neil Craig, as as, as long as the eye can see. <laughs> that's right. You know, that was tenure. That worked out so well for Carlton when he did it. <laughs> but you, I mean, you're right, Pete. That is that is the uh, that is the culture of the club. It's about tenure. There's no tension down there for spots. There's no. It's not a vibrant organisation. It's, it's a very comfortable, cosy organisation that just thinks it's a little bit better than what it actually is at the moment, in my opinion. And when you take away that tension, then you know that that's where the power the the, the power then resides. You know, it resides with the players. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stop being bloody Debbie Downer. <laughs> You know what? I came on. I came on last Tuesday with the with the intent of thinking. Well, I, I can't be too negative this week. You know, we'll, we'll, knock, we'll knock over the kangaroos on Saturday, and then we could we could get ourselves to probably five two. And now I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard because the, the problem is, is that this is the part of the draw that they really needed to, you know, make a statement from this in this first five or six games because it, you know, they've still got 
you know, Geelong away, we've still got West Coast away, we've still got Brisbane away. They're, they're not games that we're going to win. No. You know, and, and so, you know, we've got, we haven't played Collingwood yet. We've got West Coast twice yet. Yeah. Um, they've got GWS to play. They've got, you know, they've got a, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> hey, you, guys, you guys poo-pooed me last week when I said, nope, North are going to win. That. <sighs> So anyway, no, I told you so. And, I, and, I, and am I the most optimistic person on this panel? Mm. Yes, you are. <laughs> no, Donkey is. Oh, yeah, sorry, Donkey. Yeah, yeah, true. Come on. True. Do we true. actually really listen to Donk? Anyway, yes, yes we, do. we do. Anyway, look, it's it's. I feel a bit sad for the players. There's some players that have given their heart and soul for the club. Tex given his heart and soul for the club. Sloaney, Talia, yeah, yeah. you know, those blokes. And I, I just wish the club would actually do them a service and put the correct people around them and give them some new talent to work with uh, and give yep. them a, give them an opportunity that you know what that would give them a bump yeah and and you'd be surprised you know, I reckon you'd be surprised at um, how many games you know you might win as opposed to you know thinking that you're just going to get flogged by 20 goals every week because you're playing you know half a dozen youngsters yeah yeah you still got a lot of good players around them yeah a lot of there good are players. although the, the one thing I think this is what has really shown is how much we miss Brown and that back line. Well, and Tom. I'm not sure any, I'm not sure anyone makes a difference at the moment, Nick, but anyway. I, I think I think the biggest loss that we've had is Tom because I think we've just any any rebound yeah. we were going to have from half back. Uh, you know, um Robbo was on 360 the other night talking about, you know, the crows of old and all the bounce we got off half back and all the rest of it. We're completely stagnant off half back now and that's why our our entries are haphazard, and our and our scoring is down. We just, and I think, uh, not that I think Tom would have been the difference between winning and losing, but I think he's he's probably um, had the most impact in terms of his his ability to 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 play a role down back and give confidence to some mm. of the other blokes. Yeah, there's one uh, one of those uh, one of those players that. that Roams across halfback that I reckon is pretty comfortable down there, and really Lady. he's one that really really needs a rocket. No, number thirty three, I reckon he's very very comfortable there. And um, I don't think he, he's comfortable. He looks he scared. He never he never ever comes under any scrutiny that player, and um, I just reckon he's one that just 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 goes along, well, just gets it, just does his. I don't he know. Looks scared. To, he looks scared to me. He does not want to take any chances. He oh, does not yeah. want to do the running anymore. Well, mm. not only that, Nick, Pete, I I kind of disagree because what's the one thing you haven't seen from Brody anymore this season so far? Well, I haven't seen much from him at all, to be honest. No, but have you seen him try to lace out a 40 or 50 metre pass? Um, no, not, not that I can recall. No. You, you blame, well, you could say it's the forward's fault. But the, no, 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 I reckon it's game plan. Is it? It's game, you plan. it's game plan. Well, because yeah, maybe. we are playing this chip around keep possession game, and so we're not actually u- utilizing Brody's strength, which is his ability to break a line. Because we're not actually trying to break a line at the moment. So all you see Brody doing is these little dinky little twenty meter passes, mm. and I reckon it's instruction because Brody's instinct. If he's not concentrating, his natural instinct is to boot the ball 60 metres down the line. We yeah. haven't seen any of that. All we've seen is dinky little 20 metre passes. And mm. to me, Brody's form is actually uh, indicative of what our game plan looks like at the moment. And I, d- I just don't think it's a natural way to play the game of football. Mm. No, yeah. fair call. The other one that's comfortable, I reckon, though, Pete, is Laird. Well, yeah. where, where's he going? And he's had a horrendous start to the year. He finally played a bit more proactively and a bit more like the land we know against North, but the previous games have been shite. Yeah, I, I thought he was sat on a bit uh, in the Hawthorne match, um, but he, he hasn't been in good form. And, I mean, you could run through the whole list, but there, there are a couple of standouts that, that you know... Even Miller hasn't been terribly dynamic off no. half back. He's been okay in patches when he's run through the midfield, but he hasn't been dynamic off half back. And mm. I actually, I actually 
don't think they've got a license to be dynamic. I think they are playing some weird, rigid... You, you remember the JLT game against GWS, Pete? And in the yeah. first half, we were a free-running team. And in the second yep. half, we started to play like Hawthorne and chip it around. Yep. It's that second no. half that we've, that we've brought into the season. That chip yeah, it around yeah. stuff. It, it's that seems to be the decision. That's this is how we're going to play, and I just mm. don't think it's working for our playing group. Yeah, look, I, I used to, when you see them play like they do, you can just you, you really you can go down a hundred different burrows, can't you? It's game plan, it's attitude, it's form, it's you know, it's a whole lot of things, isn't it? Mm. And all that comes back to coaches. Yeah. All of that comes back to the coaching staff. Yeah, because if the players don't don't believe, they won't put in, they won't make a yard when they need to. Mm. And that's the fault of the coaches in not making them believe. Or, or putting well, something Campo together. Coming out, Campo coming out, of course, and hanging the players out to dry him. So, yeah. I As he, as he did. Yeah. I, yeah. I... I Look, I don't. I don't want to continue to be negative. I've. I've said what I think. But I. I unless the, the the barometer for me will be if JJ gets dropped. Until JJ gets mm. dropped, we're not serious. Yep. As a football yep. club, he's no, that's got good to call. get dropped. He's good got call. to get dropped this week on that performance. Yep. Because that performance should be not acceptable. Good Any, call. Anyway, uh, I reckon we'll. I reckon uh, we'll get up in a close one. Against the Suns, probably only because it's Eddie's Eddie's three hundredth. Yep. Yeah, no more than a, three or four goals. That would be maximum, I reckon. Yeah, and I reckon it'll be an ugly game. Yeah, of course it will. Because I mean, they're not they're, they're not a bad side. No. Well, they're a team on the rise. Uh, yep. And uh, look, Jude seems to have got them playing for each other, so that always helps. Nick, what do you yeah, reckon? I've, I've liked I've liked watching um, Gold Coast. I, I was one of those who actually thought they might be a bit on the move this year. I think they will tire towards the middle and the end of the year, and they they do do a lot of travelling, which doesn't help a young side. It can gel a group together quite well, but it is also quite draining. Yeah, it's good um, observation when they when they're new. Um, so I I think that's our little advantage is they've had to do a bit of travelling recently. And they've had a lot of close games. Yeah. So for me, that's the only reason why I'm tipping <laughs> with the way we are. If we don't drop JJ, that's going to be a major issue. Except I'm not yeah. sure whether they had a good matchup for two tools. The, drop, anyway. the dropping of JJ is that kind of it's that line in the sand, you know, like when uh, they brought McKay back. Off of no preseason, <laughs> it's that, you know what I mean. It's that decision that it's you just the reverse D Mac. It's just it's there's just no there's no forward movement in this club at all. Yeah. It's inertia. Yeah, that's right. Look, speaking of tipping, let's get into some competition news, shall we? And I have to say um, thank you, as usual, to all our patrons uh, that have supported us via Patreon. Uh, we've got them listed there. Megan, Michael, Nicholas, Pam, Paul, J-Mac, Ben, Chris, Mark and Tim. Um, I was hoping to have some uh, sponsorship news tonight, but that's still being finalised. So uh, maybe on Sunday we'll have that all together. Um, but look, we do thank everyone for their support um, of, the, of the cast as usual. Uh, if you want to support us, obviously, you can go to our website and click the Patreon button or you can go to patreon.com forward slash aflcrowcast.com. Also, don't forget, if you listen to us on iTunes, you can give us a review and a, and a star rating on iTunes. That kicks it along. Um, and make sure that uh, if you've got some crows-loving friends, share the cast, share the links on Facebook, share them on Twitter, get people involved. Uh, we do want to grow this cast and get out to as many people as possible. So... Uh, and with all that being said, uh, Nikki, my tipping sucked on the weekend. I got four. <laughs> so did I, and I'm still on top. I yeah. don't know how that happened. Yeah, because everyone else sucked as well. Um, I think the <laughs> highest, I think, uh, what do we have? Uh, DSG got five, and he was the lone five. Um, then we had Joel, Rx, Tree, me, Matt, and you on four, and then uh, the rest. 
So uh, it's still fairly tight, the pack. Uh, you on 21 and then a bunch of us on 20 and then another bunch on 19 and 18. So lots to play for. We will have a surprise there. Now, you know, Donkey would take 20 minutes talking about the Dream Team because it's his little love child. <laughs> the difference between... Is he actually winning? Well, I don't know so much whether he's winning, but the difference between him and I is that I'm not winning. Uh, <laughs> I'm, in fact, absolutely hopeless when it comes to Dream Team and therefore I'm not going to spend any time on it whatsoever. So that was competitions. Nick, have you got a Coke Wumble for us? Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to watch a lot of football on the weekend so this makes it a bit hard so if anybody's got any um they would like to nominate so from the cast on um sunday night there was the chat all wanted to nominate ben brown for the the dive that he took do you guys have anybody who's done anything particularly stupid you can think of oh look for me the winner is uh, mitch mcgovern <laughs> what about you fane uh, no, I haven't got any. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, it's been quite a an an okay ish. Um, so I I I do like I didn't see it, but I think for the uh, oh my god, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but the the lovely German word um ah no, I don't even Schaden, want to attempt to do it. Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. <laughs> That's it. I didn't want to do it and <laughs> get it wrong. I think that we've definitely got to give it to Gov. Love it. Yeah, I'm happy with Gov. Anyway, guys, uh, that was a bit of a uh, event, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you got you got to do it. You got to do it. But look, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, amazing. Uh, we cracked six hundred on uh, Spreaker with comments, so we just love you guys on Spreaker, um, chatting away there. It's uh, fantastic, and we get some good little tidbits of information along the way. So thanks everyone there. <laughs> Thanks to everyone listening to us on Facebook. Of course, you can catch the uh, cast anytime you like on Spreaker.com forward slash user forward slash AFL Crowcast or Facebook.com forward slash AFL Crowcast or our website, aflcrowcast.com. Uh, th- this weekend, Cam and I are going to have another crack at the rev up um, and obviously on Sunday night. Uh, now our game is on Sunday this week, so um, I would It'd imagine that. A bit that later. I reckon the wrap might be eight o'clock this week, um, but we'll ser- yes. we'll we'll certainly post on all the social media media channels um, closer to the day. But uh, we'll be on at eight, I would imagine. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, mate. It was an analytical rant tonight, at least. It, it was. It, it had some substance. It made me feel better. Oh well, that's <laughs> that's the main thing. Thanks, everyone. We'll see See you on uh, the weekend. Goodbye. Not all.